So just to kind of take take two, um, I'm speaking with Derek Stewart at the moment and he is a business development manager at Flatpak. Is that? Flat Planet. Flat Planet, sorry. Flat Planet, sorry. Um, how long have you been doing that for at the moment? Um, so I did it for a couple of years when I actually lived and worked over in Manila in the Philippines and then um, sort of had a few years in sort of cybersecurity in some different areas when I moved back to Australia and then the last sort of um, six or seven months since the start of 2021 been sort of yeah, back at Flat Planet. So on and off for a couple of years. On and off in a couple of years. All right. And kind of bringing it back, uh, we were going to play a bit of trivia um, and it, the trivia is going to be Tennis, tennis related. You can't be serious, uh, man. You cannot be John serious. McEnroy on the call as well here, but uh, we, we, we're going to do a bit of tennis trivia. So uh, the first question is, and these questions are going to get more difficult as we go on. So the first are going to be pretty easy, but the first question is, what type of material are tennis balls covered with? Ah, um, wow. I, I don't know what the actual material is. I've uh, hit a lot of them back in the day, but no, um. I'm not sure what is it. Some is it a uh, some? Yes. It, it wouldn't be um, sort of uh, cotton. It would be some sort of uh, artificial. Um, hard to guess. Is it almost like a, a what do you call it? like a synthetic sort of wool or what would you call it? I'm yeah, not sure. felt. Felt. Okay. Uh, during a tennis match, if someone has a score of love, how many points do they have? Zero. That's right. Of the Grand Slam tournaments, which was established first? Uh, I don't know for sure, but I'm going to guess Wimbledon. Which was established in 1877, followed by the US Open. This one's a bit more tough. Uh, the longest singles match in recorded history. Who was it? Uh, who was it played by? Um, I, I think I remember my dad talking about it a long time ago. Was it uh, Ivan Gulagong? I don't know who they were playing. Um, maybe the in the seventies, and it went what? to like fifty to forty-eight <laughs> or something like that. Or was it the seventy-five to seventy-three? I, I remember hearing about the, the epic uh, fifth set that kind of went. Or, or am I way <laughs> off base? Uh, I think that might have been second. The second longest, but uh, we, we, we were looking for John Isner and Nicholas Mahut. Okay, um, yeah, no idea on that. <laughs> so yeah, that that was uh, that lasted eleven hours and five minutes over three days. But um, yeah, that's enough about trivia. Uh, I thought I just something creative, something a bit random. So um, yeah, thanks for playing. Yeah, no. Uh, I, what did I get? Two out of four, I think. Or <laughs> so. Uh, uh, we're not keeping track. I mean, it's just okay. to kind of get the uh, the creative juices going and get the brain kind of thinking a little bit. So um, kind of digressing a little bit and you were a personal trainer at one stage in, in your life. How has personal personal training shaped your life, not in the literal sense, but how has it shifted your internal perception of the world? Yeah, no, that's a really great question. So actually, I guess it would make sense if I explain how I got into it. I, I was sort of, you know, an athletic kid growing up, but then in my sort of teen years, I went from sort of five foot tall to six foot tall in about a year and a half. So I had a huge sort of puberty growth spurt. And while I was sort of growing, you know, I guess the body's very hungry and it sort of wants to be fed. So I sort of, you know, overate to an extent and was a big eater, actually gained a lot of weight and ended up quite heavy. And then at the end of year 11, I, I, I was actually 115 kilos. I made a New Year's resolution. You Year 12 of all years when you're studying and, and trying to sort of work hard and focus on that to lose weight so i got a gym membership for the first time learned about nutrition i lost 35 kilos in uh, in year 12 and um i think 16 inches off my waist so huge transformation and then um afterwards you know i wanted to help others to you know you know obviously everyone asks you how do you lose weight what do you do what's the secret and uh, you know teach me and i was very deep in that sort of world so while i was at university i was actually running a fitness business um and that's how i was a personal trainer for three years so i think the, the meta lessons were really about behavioral change because that's really what it comes down to. Like fitness is the vehicle and the behavior, eating, sleeping, stress, nutrition, exercise, people are trying to change. But the real meta lesson is on human psychology, uh, behavioral change, habit formation, um, 
sustainability of habits. A lot of people can do something for 30, 60, 90 days, but it has to be sort of sustainable. Otherwise, you're going to gain the weight back or go back to the bad habit or quit the intense workouts or whatever you're doing. So I think the meta lessons were, um, you know, so human behavior, psychology, um, habits, um, and, and then there were other lessons about running a small business that were sort of, you know, I could speak on too. But is that is that sort of what you're looking for? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot to unpack in there. And I think you touched on this thing that I'm a bit curious about, habit formation, because it's very tough these days to either take up a new habit or get rid of an existing habit. Do you mind speaking more into that, into that side of things? Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I used to have these discussions with a lot of the clients and, and people I was training at the time where people would get very focused on what's the best type of exercise and, you know, the fashion, the fitness industry is a bit like the fashion industry. Zumba's popular, then it's uh, F45 and then pole dance and CrossFit and then jumping on a trampoline and, and people are always chasing kind of what's the next exciting thing and, and people would say, oh, I hate going to the gym but everyone tells me i have to lift weights that's the best and i'd say i'd always ask them i'd say do you have time for all the things you want to do and i'd say no i want to learn a language i want to play the guitar again i want to spend more time and i said well if you don't even have time for the things you want to do how are you going to make time for something you don't want to do right. and going back to that behavioral change that's where i really shifted away because when i started you know you, you geek out on this sets and reps and exercise and calories and macros and, and you realize compliance you know good advice not followed is bad advice and compliance is actually the most important so i'd say but if you hate the gym but you love you know salsa dancing and, and that's energetic and you're willing to do it a few times a week and then do that like don't don't go to the gym if you hate it don't talk to yourself yeah some people will, will grow to, to like it over time once they learn it or or they might enjoy it but you know do exercise you enjoy that or if you enjoy rock climbing or walking or bike riding or whatever i could argue this is 10 or 20 percent better but if you don't do it it's zero percent better so whereas if you love playing tennis go play tennis you know and, and obviously nutrition, other little habits as well as food. I hate this food. I can't give up this food. And then I'd, I'd work within that framework. Whereas if I give a, a, a goal that's so unrealistic, they hate it, they hate their life, they hate those foods, well, they're never going to stick with it. And that's that behavioral change, psychology sort of stuff where you can only torture yourself for so long before you burn through your willpower and you sort of give up and stop. So it's got to be sustainable. And part of that is people have to enjoy the process. Um Otherwise, yeah, they're just going to quit and run out of willpower to, to torture themselves after a point in time. Yeah, that's the, the golden thing, isn't it? The willpower. I mean, what is that saying? The will to live or something or other? I don't know. I'm kind of stuffing it up. But yeah, I mean, it's it's an interesting, that's an interesting part of your life because I think kind of doing my research on you, you seem like a very interesting person because you've got that um that uh, athletic background, and then you've also got the educational background. You, you're you're in accounting, I believe. Um, and what you were, what were you studying? Sorry, what you were in University of Melbourne. Yeah, so, so like I said, I lost all the weight at high school. Got really into fitness, but I sort of, you know, at high school I did all the business subjects like accounting, legal, economics. I thought like, you know, I didn't want the arts track. I didn't want the science track. I sort of went the business track. Um, you know, because my mum was sort of arts, humanities, my dad was science. So I was kind of like, well, I don't like either of them. And then when I, I realised year 10 or 11, there's a sort of business pathway, I, I went full speed on that. So I got into commerce at Melbourne Uni. Um, like I said, I lost all that weight. So while I was at uni, I also did a Cert 3, Cert 4 in fitness and started the fitness business. Um, but yeah, double majored in accounting and marketing and thought I wanted to be an accountant in a big firm. Um, like a lot of people do, you know, you, you go through and you, you think you're going to get a grad job. And I got a grad job at a big firm. And then, you know, six months in, I sort of hated it and wanted something completely different. You know, just various things about the culture and the people and the structure of large professional service firms and all the billable hours and just, you know, a whole bunch of stuff, the hierarchy that I didn't really love. So I, um, yeah, wanted to do something different. I traveled a bit, um, you know, in between finishing uni and starting the job because you kind of get the job 12 months in advance. So I backpacked around the US for a few months. Um, I knew the fitness was just kind of a short-term thing, that the long-term thing was the, the um, corporate world. But yeah, didn't like accounting and then I wanted to sort of live and work overseas and that's where I started applying for jobs all over the world. Um, I, I didn't want to go to a Western country though. I didn't want to go to America, UK, New Zealand, Canada um, because I thought it's too similar. If I'm going to go overseas, I want an adventure. I want something very different. Um, and then, you know, I got job offers to teach English in Guatemala and Russia and all these interesting places, but I didn't want to be an English teacher. I still wanted a corporate job. So sort of how do I get a corporate non-accounting job without, I don't speak Spanish, so I can't work in the corporate world in South America and I don't speak, you know, Russian. But then the Philippines actually came up as a destination where I could, um, 
you know, I could still get an English speaking corporate job because a lot of Australian entrepreneurs there. It's a former US colony. Um, but I could also have an adventure and sort of work overseas. So that's that interesting zigzag from fitness to accounting for a short time to where I sort of spent half a decade living and working in the Philippines. Okay. So you spent half a decade in the Philippines and kind of touching back into the historic roots of the Philippines, I'm not aware of the, the the background what you mentioned that they were a colony uh so what's the historic background of the philippines yeah so i think they were sort of spanish colony magellan if you remember magellan from your history books the first one to sort of circumnavigate the, the world so the first one to prove the world wasn't flat when he, he sailed and, and sort of was able to come back because that was a big debate for a long time you know because you look okay. at the horizon and you think you just fall off the edge but um can i just sorry, can i just intercept you sorry uh i do have a i'm just gonna cheekily plug my podcast i've got a flat earthing podcast i just thought i'd throw that in there but um sorry sorry to, sorry to cut you off there sorry. yeah no so, so there's some still surviving flat earthers but um <laughs> it, it sounds like you've interviewed some which are always a great chat but um but yeah that was a big debate and, and again i might make some historical mistakes here minus things Magellan was the first one to actually go around the world spanish guy and um he actually died in the philippines i went and you can see the the place in, in cebu where he died and the cross and it's sort of a lot of history there but so actually i think in the the 1500s, sort of a, a Spanish colony, like a lot of South America, for about 300 years. Um, and then I think in 1898, they actually sold the Philippines. Again, once upon a time, and you can buy and sell countries like Russia and America did with Alaska and Mexico and other things, that they, the Spain sold um, the Philippines to America for, I think, 20 or $50 million. Um, so then the Americans, I, I think the Filipinos thought they were about to get independence, but the Americans bought it. And like I said, history is sort of very different than these days. We can buy and sell countries. So the Americans sort of came in, I think, in the uh, late 1800s, early 1900s. And then it was under American rule for sort of 40, 50 years. Um, so it's actually, um, they had the US dollars as their currency. They, you know, had obviously a lot of American sort of people there. Um, yeah, sort of like Guam, if you know Guam. So it's sort of similar. It's a US yeah. colony or or some of the islands Australia still has sort of as colonies Guam, or territories. Is Guam, is, is Guam near Cambodia or? Yeah, it's sort of an island, but, it, but it's sort of, yeah, a couple of hours from sort of Southeast Asia. So that's, again, an island, but it's actually U.S. territory. So everything's in English, U.S. dollars. If you have a U.S., if you um, have a U.S. passport, you can go there without a visa and stuff. So okay. and, and, uh, my understanding, again, is, is sort of from 1900 to you know, 1945, 1950, it was actually a U.S. colony. And that's why a lot of the schools are in English, signs are in English. Um, but there's, if you go to the Philippines, a lot of the place names and even the language is very Spanish influenced in the cuisine. So you can see the sort of histories, I think, as a Japanese colony for about a decade um, with sort of World War II. And then they became sort of independent sort of after that. So, um, again, probably made a few mistakes along the way. But but in, in terms of my recollecting of the history, but that's my understanding. That's why it's a big, um, there's a local indigenous sort of Filipino culture. There's a Spanish, massive Spanish influence. And then there's also very Western American sort of influence. So it's an interesting hybrid of, uh, of multiple cultures. Yeah, funny you mentioned that because I, I have noticed the Filipino culture, like they're beautiful people and yeah, they've got that mix mash of all these different cultures. I, is there a bit of French in there as well or I'm not even sure... Um, I'm not sure. Again, they're, they're like every cult, every country is influenced by, you know, pe migrants and, and people who move from all different places. But there's definitely a big French influence in Asia, in like Vietnam. That's why you see all the baguettes. Yes. And in, uh, in China and Shanghai, there's a French quarter. Um, there's a lot of sort of French speaking. So the French as well as the English and the Americans were, were very sort of active in, uh, in the Dutch, again, once upon a time, sort of 50 to 500 years ago in all those sort of areas. So, yeah, it's definitely a big influence from all those sort of countries and other countries that the first chinatown ever was in uh the philippines about a thousand years ago um right. so there's a, a big chinese influence and then i think there's some um sort of the southern philippines is sort of a islamic sort of area as well so there's that sort of influence too so it is a a mix of a whole bunch of different countries and interesting hi historical you know artifacts and you can even see uh, Japanese fighter planes that are stuck in mountains and hills and tunnels and things like that. And World War II submarines you can scuba dive through at the bottom of the sea in, in the Philippines. So huge amount of history um, in the country for sure. Okay. And taking it back to your, your working career in the Philippines. So what you were you in charge of outsourcing for your company or yeah, what was the, the background story into that? Yeah, so, so like I said, I was looking for jobs overseas and, you know, I had my criteria, not 
you know, Western country, but also a corporate job, which I said was hard. But then the Philippines came up as an opportunity. And there was an Australian company that interviewed me. Um, and it was a Skype interview at the time when Skype was the, the best in sort of video conferencing technology back in 2013. Um, and they liked me one or two rounds of interviews. They said, when can you get here? I said, well, you know, in about three weeks. And then never been to Asia, but bought a, a one-way ticket, packed a bag with a, a job and a visa in hand, because that's all you sort of need, again, in, in a pre-COVID world to, to live overseas. Once you've got a job and a visa, you figure out the rest when you get there. Um, and it was essentially a six-month marketing internship, which is just, you know, an all-rounder, do a bit of this, do a bit of that, kind of help out, learn the business. But it was great because... I, um, you know, I learned all the ins and outs of sort of the industry, the business um, as an entrepreneurial sort of growth company, not Flat Planet. This was a different company, which I think isn't around anymore. But um, but they were the ones who sort of brought me over there. And that's where I sort of met and, and still friends with people from there. And uh, the first person who hired me is not the CEO, but he was sort of the, the sales director. So I learned from him. And after about six months, they absorbed me. So originally, I thought, well, worst case scenario, if I hate it, in six months, I can go home. And you know, it'd be a fun experience and a fun story. But then I liked it and settled in and, and enjoyed it. And then they offered to sort of absorb me on an ongoing basis after that internship. And I spent another 18 months in more business development sales. So again, the Australian clients used to fly over and would visit, would chat and do things like that. Um, and then I would fly to Australia and sort of handling more sales. That's where I really got into sales as a sort of a profession, business to business or B2B sales. Um, learned a lot from the, again, the CEO at the time who was an excellent salesperson of B2B services um, and then moved to sort of Flat Planet in, in sort of 2015 and did more process improvement, operational sort of roles. Um, and then now I'm in Melbourne doing business development for Flat Planet again. So that was sort of, yeah, my entry into the industry and, and the early roles and, and how I transitioned out from being sort of an accountant to, to what I'm doing now. Okay. Sounds like a very interesting journey. And you touched on the idea of sales. You mentioned that your boss was a was a good salesperson. What why why do you think he was a good salesperson? I think one of the big things I learned from him was the ability to sort of sell invisible or intangible things. So when you've got a physical product, there's a lot of benefits, a car, a house, you know, a real estate person like here's a house, here's a thing. It's like, oh, okay, okay. And but there's a fixed price, there's a fixed product or a car. It's like at the end of the day, the salesperson's important, the experience, the quality, some you know, bad salespeople will put people off. But at the end of the day, you're going to have the house or the car for, for years or decades. If you never talk to the salesperson again, it doesn't really matter. In sort of business to business where you're selling you know, business services, um, especially if it's an ongoing nature, um, it, it really matters a lot more the relationship and the commitment and the idea and things like that. So it's not just, oh, I've got my car. I don't care if the person was obnoxious. Now I've got the car. I'll never see him again. It's sort of, so the relationship's really important, the trust. But also what he was very good at was selling um, the future in a big and exciting way. So I would see him have a, you know, would be in the boardroom there and, and would have, you know, the CEO of a company and, and he's, you know, an entrepreneur or CEO. And he was very good at kind of quickly slicing what their business was, what their challenges were, and then getting them super excited about a big future vision. Well, what if you did this? And what if you did this? And we can do this and we can do that. And by the end of the, the one hour meeting, they were basically ready to, you know, write him a $500,000 check to provide all these sort of services and things like that because he got them so interested and excited and he opened their mind. Um, and once he saw they were sort of that entrepreneurial, open-minded people, and then they were so excited and engaged, like, well, where do I sign? And they wanted to just sort of get started. And then some of those things with services, maybe we didn't even actually have at that point, but then he would go and, and sort of organize and get them sort of going. Um, but it's just getting people super excited and, and that blank canvas of imagination and saying, well, have you thought about this or why not this? Or here's a way you could add X million in revenue and here's a way you could streamline and here's an interesting positioning in the market. And it would just sort of, you'd see people's minds sort of explode as he was sort of just explaining to them. It wasn't buy this thing. It's like, what about this? What about this? It's very strategic, very um, sort of like a solution selling, some people call it, or consultative sort of selling. But yeah, just watching him do that again and again and again and again, I guess I learned some of that of how to sort of pitch ideas that people didn't even think of and they get so excited about the idea, they just want to grab it and go for it. Okay. Oh, that's interesting. Okay. Yeah. The salesperson. Yeah. Uh, well, it, actually, it's funny you mentioned that because I guess my journey onto this podcast, I've, I guess I've trying to learn how to become a better salesperson, a better promoter, a better marketer. And yeah, there's all these little tricks and trades and, and things you can pick up. And I guess I want to just share one learning, one lesson yeah. that I've learned on my journey. And that's uh, you never want to go for the hard sale. Um, mm. I mean, I'm not an expert. I could be wrong on this, but uh, look, I, I figured that you, you can't, it's very difficult to hard sell, 
hard sell somebody uh, who you don't really have a relationship with. So I, yeah, I'm trying to build now I'm on a, in a stage where I'm building relationships with people and um, I have, maybe if I have a product, it's there, if they want it, they can have it. You know, they know me as Christian buddy or they know my podcast and that's where I'm at at the moment. So I just find it interesting. Um, sales. Yeah, no, and I'd agree. Like I said, there's some things, it's very transactional. It's a one-time thing. Like I said, you know, often like buying a house, something like that. Um, you know, but so some, again, not to throw sort of real estate agents under the bus, but some of them will sort of push because again, once they get the deal, they sort of go on and they might never see you again. Or maybe 10 years later, you're buying or selling a house. And at the end of the day, the person's really buying the house. They're not buying your advice, your services. But even having said that, the really, really good real estate agents who do well do not push people. They don't hard sell. They, they get a good result because they know the long-term value is a person refers their friend, their family, their kids, their, their colleague, their cousin. So they get future sales and referrals. Maybe they downsize, they upsize, they move locations, they move into state, they buy an investment property, they sell an investment property. So some people might say, well, yeah, I got the sale, but well, you lost the next 20 referrals after that. Because you pushed too hard, you made them feel pressured, you rushed them, you you, you uh, sort of steamrolled them too much versus someone who, you know, is still assertive and um, helps and gives advice and is um, gives a tough love or harsh feedback when they need, but also guides them. They're going to get the next 10 or 20 or 30 referrals. So I think some people come in hard, get good results in the short term because they kind of front loaded all the results, then they've burned all the bridges and there's no future referrals, relationships. Um, things like that. So I'd agree. So, and, and then if it's an ongoing service, again, if you sort of pressure into that, a lot of people don't want an ongoing relationship with someone who doesn't respect them or they feel that isn't listening or pressures them or things like that. So I like, see so you can kind of get away with it, transactional sort of one time or, or small items where someone just wants the item. You don't care if you're, you're buying a, a suit and the, the, the retail salesperson is pressuring you or you need the suit and then you're just not going to go to that shop again. But, you know, but if that you did a great experience they might you might come back for your next suit or refer your friend or again buy other clothes there so yeah i'd always sort of emphasize not sort of hard selling and building a relationship and considering the long-term lifetime value of the relationship and the future referrals repeat business and not trying to just sort of suck out all the value um and, and maximize the short term the expense of the long term absolutely yeah don't be a bad salesperson mm. <laughs> that's the, the moral of the story uh Kind of shifting gears now, and I have listened to your podcast. Uh, so you you host the Future of Australia podcast mm -hmm. uh, on a mission to interview the founders and entrepreneurs running the fastest growing businesses in Australia. And I actually listened a bit of research for this in this uh, podcast. I, I listened to your first episode, <laughs> and I listened to your last episode that you released, and uh, I can definitely hear a a, a, a an, an yeah. There's definitely I can hear the evolution in your in your show i listened to your first episode demi and steve berry from pinnacle sales and management mm -hmm. and then i also it's it's not your latest episode but it's one of your newer episodes ben hutt from evergreen mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i really enjoyed listening to to ben hutt i i found that he had um he had a when I was listening to him, he had a sense of experience. Uh, he's a hard. He sounds like a hardworking entrepreneur. Mm. He grew up in a pig farm. Uh, so shout out to that episode. And if you aren't, <laughs> if you guys aren't subscribed to uh, the Future of Australia, you should give it a listen. And I think you would be, you guys will be impressed with with that. Um, yeah, no, thanks. I, I really appreciate it. And yeah, and sometimes I cringe when I listen to some of the first episodes. The audio is so bad, the intro is sloppy, my my questioning. But but it's also humbling because you go back, and I'm sure you do too, with your early episodes. You see how far you've come, and, and so you, you can't. Obviously, you've got to respect the people who gave a, a, me a chance before I even had a, a name in the podcast. I just emailed ten ten of them, and three replied from my Gmail address. I didn't have a podcast, and I recorded them. And then once I had three, I was like, oh, this could be something. And then I registered the domain futureaustralia.com and came up with the idea and put in the intros and outros, but they just replied to a cold Gmail email and, and sort of agreed. So obviously would never take those episodes down and, and, and they still get listens too, but but I, I do cringe at the quality, but, but like I said, it reminds you of the journey. And now I've got a professional voiceover, intro, outro, better quality audio, hopefully better questioning, um, but still great guests all the way through, but, but the production values have lifted and, and it makes it a more enjoyable experience, I think, for the audience. Absolutely. How are you, what podcast hosting service are you using? 
Uh, so it's on SoundCloud um, as the host, and then it's sort of the RSS feed goes out through Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, and all the other um, cast box, all, all the main sort of listening uh, platforms. Do you manually have to set all the RSS feeds up, or is that automatic? Um, I think I set them up once, and then the others sort of pull out of it. I think Spotify as well. I had to sort of uh, fill in some stuff, and that sort of um, so Spotify because when I started, at Spotify wasn't as big on podcasts, whereas now they're, they're quite big on podcasts. And then I was going to try and get into Amazon Music and a few other platforms. But I think some of those again, I've got to sort of follow up. But some are automatic. It's just the the players sort of pull all the main feeds, and others you've got to manually submit it once, and then it sort of um, goes auto syncs. I think from then onwards. And. S- in terms of SoundCloud, what what are their do you are you a bit of an analytics? Do you kind of jump into all the the uh, listens, the downloads, the s- subscribes, and all that sort of stuff? Yeah, and no, I am curious sometimes. So I, I do pull it up, and I'm I'm fascinated sometimes. Both the countries people are in, or get people in interesting parts of the world, interesting cities and states listening. I'm always sort of curious, um, and, and also seeing where where people are finding it from. Um, and just, yeah, sometimes you get a big spike on a certain episode, which episode is the most popular. That's always interesting to see. Um, so, yeah, I, I do sort of look in the panel once or twice a week out of just curiosity, really, and seeing the, the growth and the listener numbers and geographies and um, episode popularity and things like that. So it is uh, it is a bit fascinating to, to delve into. Are you Do you have any paid advertising? No, no, I've been approached by some Blinkers and some of those other ones that are doing a huge amount of podcast sponsorship. Um, I've thought about it, but at this point, yeah, I haven't really put any paid sponsors or affiliate sort of stuff on it. It's just me at the moment. Uh, 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 what about paid marketing to promote? Do, do you do any paid promotion? I know there's like so you can promote your podcast on Spotify or Facebook ads or something like this. Is that something you've tried before? No, I mean, it's something I've thought about, but at the moment, it's just been fairly organic. I post on LinkedIn because, again, sort of business audience is the main one. I've got my email marketing list. Um, I post on Facebook. Um, you know, when uh, I'm able to do guest podcasts, that's always great as well. I'm writing a book, extracting out some of the lessons this year of the all the people I've interviewed. I'm going to use that book as a bit of a promotional tool because then obviously it's sort of it's from the podcast. And if they want to hear more of the stories, they can listen to the podcast and I think sometimes a hard thing as well is a lot of podcasts grow by featuring on other podcasts and then they sort of, I come on your podcast, you come on mine because mine's quite niche. Like I only interview the the uh, Australian Financial Review, the AFR's Fast 100. I can't do a lot of sort of reciprocal guest appearances. Um, but I think once I have the book, well, then I can go to talk about the book and the podcast and it's sort of, I'm going to use that as a bit of a strategy. And then in the future, yeah, I, I might even play around with some paid ads or, or other sort of promotions and things like that. Um, or boosting in, in Spotify or other sort of um, channels. So is that something you've delved into much for your podcast? I have not delved in it at all, but I am thinking I'm considering it now uh, because mm. it's just, for me, it's difficult, the organic reach. It's just not enough. And my ultimate goal is to monetize the podcast. It's a big, very difficult. For me, I, f- I feel like it's difficult. So maybe some people may say it's easy, but I, I think it's, it's, yeah, it's a big stretch. Well, I think you get good organic reach on, on YouTube. So if you're putting this on YouTube, that's really great. But podcasts, yeah, discovery is really bad. You have the top 100 list. But say you listen to an episode of my podcast or some other business podcast, it doesn't like YouTube says, hey, up next or it auto plays or you might also like this or TikTok or other sort of streams are very good at that or LinkedIn will put things in your feed. But podcasts, you just listen, that's it. And there's no, eventually Spotify might take over the whole market, um, but there's no sort of what's next and, and there's no way to, it's very hard. So it's very hand-to-hand word of mouth referrals and friends of friends and, and, and sort of manual labor to build a podcast. I've found, like I so YouTube, I've seen some big ones on YouTube and then they, they take the audio out and, and then it gets a lot of things like, uh, you know, Joe Rogan and, and others, or some people have a big brand like a Tim Ferriss or a Michelle Obama or other people, they've already got a big brand and they have a podcast and obviously a lot of people look them up and see it or they've got a big blog and a big email list so they can sort of push people to that. But growing from scratch, if you haven't got the audience or the, or the brand name and if you haven't got the algorithm sort of boosting you up like a YouTube thing, um, I think that's hard. Also, the other thing I, I find, like there's no comments. You can't comment on a Spotify or Apple podcast. Right? So you don't get that community building, whereas YouTube shows, even if they're only on YouTube, man, they're not even a podcast, but the comments and the audience or if it's a uh, on a website or a blog, that sort of audience interaction helps a lot. And then people link to that. And there's value and, and you can get a better sense of what the audience is wanting. So definitely a few sort of limitations in the podcast infrastructure i suppose you'd say but eventually it might get to the point where spotify is better 
discoverability, shareability, um, you know, the ability and, you know, things like that or comments and other things. But the moment, the best ones I've seen have either been famous and then sort of built it or they've used YouTube and, and built a YouTube audience and they also have an audio version for people who aren't on YouTube much. Yeah. This podcast is actually on YouTube as well. It actually started off as the Christian Buddy Show on YouTube and I've kind of morphed into podcasting now. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, it's podcasting's an interesting thing. I had... Uh, Previously, I had Nick Schildberger on the show. He's he's the owner of Sound Cartel uh, mm-hmm. in in Hawthorne, and he's he was an interesting guy to speak with. And he, and he mentioned the idea of uh, if you want to become a general show or a niche, mm. um, you're you're doing the niche. But I, I I mean I still haven't really found my footing on whether where I'm going. I'm kind of I know you kind of I'm going against the grain because they all say you should be niche, but I mean, I, I do the podcast because I reach out to people mm. who I'm interested in. Um, if I want to learn about history, I, I'll get a historian on. If I want to mm. learn about uh, tennis, I'll get a tennis player or something. So it's kind of, for me, I'm, I'm, a, bit, I'm a bit greedy. I'm, I'm kind of <laughs> getting things that I'm interested in and hopefully hopefully, my audience will, will see the same. No, I would say that's honestly probably the best way to do it. Like I've been listening to podcasts for 10 plus years since they were sort of very new and I always would hear all these great business stories, but always very North American focus, which is great. And there's great stories and, and characters and people over there. And obviously it's a big market and big sort of media presence, but I wanted to hear from you know, Australian fast growth entrepreneurs and what's happening here and what are people doing here? And I looked, I couldn't really find one. And then, you know, Flat Planet itself was on the Fin Review Fast Starters, I think, uh, 2015, 16, a couple of years there. And then uh, some of our clients were also on the list. And I thought, oh, the, the Fin Review puts out this fantastic list of the 100 fastest growing new and established businesses each year, but they only get a nanosecond of attention. Then the Fin Review goes back to sort of the big corporate world. And I thought, well, I, I can take this list and I can reach out to them and have a chat to them because I'm curious. But like I say, the better way to, to network instead of saying, hey, I want to have coffee with you and you're super successful, say, hey, do you want to come to my podcast? And then people are a lot more receptive. And I, I get the learnings that I want and the podcast I wish I, I could listen to and I, I have. But then you get to share that with other people. Because if I reached out to um, like Adam Schwab, one person I had, fantastic guy, uh, Luxury Escape. So one of the fastest growing um, new businesses a year or two ago, Travels, so obviously probably been hit a bit with COVID, but went from zero to 350 million turnover in um, you know a couple of years. So super successful business. And I emailed him, said, hey, can you come on my podcast? By then I had, you know, 15 or 20 episodes. Two minutes later, he said, yep, sure, no worries. And I came by his office and sat down with him and had an hour of this, one of the most successful sort of entrepreneurial CEOs in Australia. You know, whereas if I just said, hey, you know, can I pick your brain over coffee or, or whatever people say, he'll probably ignore it. But this way I get to have an hour face to face. And then other people benefit from that episode, his insights and his written books and he's, you know, done a heap of interesting stuff. Um so you're right. It's a great networking tool. It's a great, you know, scratch your own itch curiosity tool. And um, you, I think you can always specialize in the future. If you, But if you have general interest, there's no harm in, in having general audience. I think there's an audience for people who are, are curious. And like, say, even like Joe Rogan, he, he has sort of themes, but he'll have comedians, mixed martial artists, politicians, business moguls, you know, he'll have all sorts of athletes, um, all, all sorts of, uh, of people on his show. And again, you can't use an exception always to prove the rule, but I think he follows his own curiosity and, and uh, you know, and, and so does Tim Ferriss. And they have, they're some themes, but they're quite broad and, and not sort of narrow. So I definitely say, yeah, don't stress being a generalist if that's what you're into. All right. Thanks for the advice. <laughs> Thank you, there, yeah, because it's kind of always on the back of my mind, but uh, I'm just kind of sick of, I'm, I, I don't want to, I'm, Going against the grain, and that's it. I've made my mind up. But um, kind of bringing it back to that idea that you had about the book, mm. uh, I'm, I'm I'm interested to hear what's been the the commonality between all these entrepreneurs that you've interviewed. Is there any common element that they all have that you can share? Yeah, no, a lot a lot of themes that that emerge, and one that kept coming out, and, and one guest, uh, David Bowser from Curio, sort of made a great insight, which is what sort of seeded the idea of the book. He explained how when they were a small company of, you know, maybe three or four people, everyone was a broad generalist. So they were, you know, the person doing the invoicing might also fix up the website and then answer the phone and the person doing the consulting might also do the sales. And and, and he had people who loved being sort of broad generalist because, you know, some people don't want to do the same role every day. Um, and he said as the business grew from three staff to maybe it's 50 or 100 staff in a couple of years, suddenly... He had to tell people, hey, you can't do the invoicing anymore and the website and this. We need an invoice person, 
a website person and you know maybe like a a salesperson and so he said they went from broad generalists to deep specialists and he said that and, and the theme that recurred but he's the one who kind of named the idea which a lot of other people I'd interview said as they grew a lot of the team members got really upset they didn't like the change in roles and responsibility because when you grow suddenly you know you, you might fast track 10 years of growth into two years suddenly the pain point was broad generalists and people who like the small company where there's three people and it's fun and different and you have direct access to the owner they didn't want to do the conversion to deep specialists so several almost either the people quit or they had to let go of a huge amount of people and then hire specialists because the people liked being a generalist so then they went and joined other early stage companies where they could be a generalist and someone who's a specialist who's doing all day you know payroll or invoicing or digital marketing they didn't want to be given random ad hoc tasks so and then some of the smaller firms when they bring someone in from a big company because big companies are usually full of deep specialists because you can't have everyone running around being a generalist at a big four bank um, they wouldn't want to work in a small company because they don't want to do five wear five hats. So that dichotomy between the, the broad generalist and the deep specialist and the fact that some people actually love being a, a generalist and that's fantastic, but then they shouldn't work in big companies and some people love being a specialist and then they're often best in sort of specialist roles. So the theme of the book, and, and there's more sort of to it, but um, that the size of the business matters a lot. Whether you're an employer, who you're hiring, are they going to fit? Do they want a generalist role? Do they want a specialist role? Do they Have they worked in a five-person, 50-person, 500-person company before? But even for you as the reader, if you're an employee, I'm going to have a whole chapter in insights about, well, don't just think about, oh, I want to be a lawyer, or I want to be this. Well, you know, working for a 5,000-person law firm is very different than a five-person law firm. So like some friends, you know, work at a couple of big banks or big consulting firms, oh, I hate banking or consulting or accounting, but really they just hate giant firms but if they're in a smaller firm they might actually like it um and, and it was also the idea it wasn't from the podcast but the idea also came to me where's a friend of mine who was in a sydney sort of fintech company and it was about 500 staff so sort of mid-market firm and he really liked it and he just had, had two of his best software developers quit on his team and one went and joined a 30 person startup and the other one left and uh, joined Qantas. And he couldn't understand what, what he was doing wrong. And then I also explained this idea. And I was saying, well, the one who joined the 30 person, he said, they didn't like that in a 500 person company, you don't know everyone. Whereas he liked knowing everyone's name. And when the company was younger and everyone knew everyone's name and everyone hung out together because it's 30 people like a classroom. And he felt like just a number in a 500 person company. And funnily enough, the other guy, he thought, oh, it's only 500 person. I want to work at Qantas. I want to work at a big company where like everyone knows you know your mum's proud of you and everyone sort of knows the names so yeah. i said to him maybe when you're hiring to replace them you should look for people who like a, a mid-tier 500 person company because there's certain benefits that a, a big company a big corporate or Qantas can't provide and it has benefits that a small you know 10 to 30 person startup can't provide but if you get people who don't fit the right size company because one wants to be a deep specialist one's a broad generalist and the cultural fit well, then they're not going to fit. And then that was a, something he'd never even thought of. He'd always thought skills and this. And that. He'd never put it through the filter of who would like to work in this size company um, and who's going to fit and enjoy and, and have the right match in that size company. So that's what the book's about. And that's a common theme, getting the right people for, for the right size company, whether that's outgrowing the early people, whether that's hiring from big corporates, which some say, yeah, I got people from Google and this and that, and they were terrible because they're deep specialists and I gave them other stuff and they just couldn't do it because they're used to having all this infrastructure and support and brand and it's, they didn't, so, so both for hiring ex big corporate people as well as for when you grow beyond the point of sort of the early stage. So that that's probably the most important insight and that's why I'm basing the book around that insight. Cool. Yeah, it is definitely true because I hated working at for the bank and <laughs> that, that might have been proven by their termination of me actually i was i not really say this publicly but I, I was terminated there but i mean that's another that's another story so, but, so would uh, you consider yourself more of a broad generalist and you didn't fit in yeah, in the world uh, big specialist absolutely yeah i i yeah i, I want to be in a team environment where you're actually seeing end-to-end -end the process mm. as opposed to oh let's handball it off to this guy and mm. he can do that oh who, who 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 deals with sales oh let's just handball it off to yeah. mark in sales I hated that. I I want to be from start to finish with the with the customer or the end mm. user, and the bank just had a a way to just scrutinize metrics, over scrutinize mm. metrics, 
and yeah, I, I didn't I didn't like it. So, so, so yeah, and, and even like you said, you've got broad general interests. So some people like to go deep and narrow and and be a specialist, but other people are quite broad. And you want to see the front office, the back office, the behind the scenes, the client facing, the product. So, so I think someone like yourself would do really well in a small business that needs someone who's willing to you know do a podcast, book an interview, chase up something, do a marketing, do the video tech editing, procure you know uh, audio hardware. Um, you know, troubleshoot customer service. And that's what a small business needs because there aren't enough people to, to have specialists. So they need people like you who can do five different things. So yeah, if sort of the, the specialist big corporate world doesn't work, I think, you know, for you being in a smaller, and you can get small teams inside big businesses. So the team is sort of run like a, a small business, like the cybersecurity company I work for is about a thousand staff. But in Australia, it was three. So it actually was like a small business inside a big business. So there's a lot of multinationals that are quite big in the, um, you know, like working for even working for Facebook in Australia would be a lot different than in America. In America, there's maybe 20,000 staff. I don't know, in Australia, maybe there's 200. And yeah, you're in a big system and a big machine, but you're sort of a remote outpost and a remote office. So um, whereas like a, a bank, obviously an Australian bank, the headquarters is here. But if you were in the, um, like I know a lot of the banks like, you know, HSBC and others and, uh, you know, overseas banks, they have a presence in Australia or even Vanguard. So someone like there, you might have had a lot more autonomy and freedom. Well, maybe not because sometimes it's all done by the headquarters, but you would be like a small business inside a big business. Or again, just working for a genuine sort of uh, small business with less than maybe 30 staff, you would they would welcome your willingness to take on extra stuff. Whereas in a big company, they say, hey, that's my thing. Or, hey, that's not on my job description. Or don't cross that line. Or that's a different team's responsibility. Or um, you're not allowed to do that. Whereas in a small business, oh, you want to help with the customer. You want to go out in a sales call. You want to help pack the equipment. You want to help you know, design the product. You want to do customer outreach or market uh, research calls. Or you want to fix up the website. You know, go at it. And, and they sort of, they're, they're eager to take people who are um, willing to, to extend beyond their job description if they even have one in a small business whereas in a big business you do that and it's sort of they uh, they quickly slap you back into line yeah they they know how to slap you back into line <laughs> I, I, I learned that firsthand but uh kind of and, and again some people love big corporates so it's nothing against big corporates but it's it's more like when i mentor sort of uni students and, and the alumni i sort of work with I always say it's, it's all about self-awareness like do you know who you are and, and this is one framework as well as personality and other things I sort of take people through and I say, you know, because some people love, they love doing one thing, going really, really deep, being a deep specialist. And if that's the case, they should work in a big company or a very specialized role in a big company. And other people, again, love, like yourself, different things, variety, being a generalist. Um, and again, maybe in the future, especially, but maybe you won't, right? But, you know, it, but you have to know who you are. Otherwise, it's not the big companies wrong. It's not the small companies wrong. They are who they are. They always will be that way. But you have to think, well, what size company do I want to work in? Because that, I think, has a bigger impact than the actual role. Like, um, you know, being customer service in a small business versus a big business, I'd say almost aren't even the same role. Um, you know, they're completely different roles, right? Because it, the scale, you know, like a five-person company versus a 50,000-employee company, it's almost not even the same role. Yeah, that's that's such a, such a good insight to share. Uh, I wish I would have known that. A few years ago, but, um, <laughs> yeah, that's well, right. Well, now, now that you know for the future, and any other listeners can can think, you know, what size company, and and talk to people at big companies, small companies, and because again, people think of the industry, like, but even if you speak to someone at a big, you know, a big bank, a big telco, a big insurance firm, a big mining company, there's more similarities and differences, and that's our theme of the book, you know, two five person, five employee companies, even if one's a landscaping firm and the other's an accounting firm, I would say they have more in common than the five employee accounting firm does with a 50,000 employee accounting firm. I'd say that have almost nothing in common. Yeah. You touched on cybersecurity there before and yeah, can you talk into elaborate that part of your life, the cybersecurity? Yeah, so, so I came back from the Philippines late sort of 2017, early 2018 for a great half decade there and you know, I just sort of thought after sort of half a decade it was time to come back home to Melbourne where I grew up and you know, great experience and like I said I ended up back working for Flat Planet, so um but I wanted to sort of spread my wings and do something a bit different. So I ended up um, working in cybersecurity for a big US sort of training company. Like I said, it kind of had the best of both worlds. It's a big sort of corporate, a big brand, very well known in its space with sort of 800 to 1,000 staff globally. Um, but in Australia, it was three staff. In Asia Pacific, it was like 15 staff. So it was like a small business inside a big structure with a big brand and big resources. Um, and yeah, a great experience because over in my in the Philippines, I was, and, and now I work with uh 
uh, small to medium sized businesses, entrepreneurs, scale ups, those sort of entrepreneurial, just like my podcast guests. And, and that's what I do love. And that's why I sort of gravitated back to that. But I was selling instead to police, military, uh, state and federal government, the ASX 100, the big four banks, insurers, telcos, mining, consultants. Um, so it was very, it was an interesting exposure to see the differences between the big corporate and the government world versus, you know, small business and entrepreneurs. That's also what informed some of my insights about um, the size business, the type of business, the type of people who do well in each. And so I've seen sort of both ends of the spectrum, um, small business entrepreneurs, as well as, yeah, big corporate, even government, which has its own sort of unique things, but also a lot is sort of, again, similar. You know, a big government department is, is very bureaucratic, like a big company, and a small government department is often a lot more free-flowing. So, again, it goes back to that thing of size mattering most, and that's sort of... Uh, why I'm going to include all those insights in the book along with the podcast sort of insights that uh, that's the key theme of. Sounds exciting. Yes, I'm, I'm, I'm pumped. I'm pumped. I'm waiting for the release of the book. And okay, um, yeah, because cybersecurity is a, is a pretty massive thing at the moment. Every time I flick on the news, I always see that China's trying to hack into some new country or something like that. So yeah, the, there's, there's a lot of priority and uh, it's under the microscope, this, this, this cybersecurity now, because people are getting wind of, people are having their bank details stolen and God knows what. So Yeah, no, definitely super interesting field. And I learned a lot and I really enjoyed it. Like I said, just my own sort of life priorities have changed. But um, fascinating field for anyone who's interested in IT or and even non-IT people often recruit for various sort of less technical roles. But a huge growth industry, cybersecurity, very important and good to know for yourself how to protect yourself. But um, but yeah, I mean, sort of like, you know, snatching and grabbing someone $50 from someone's wallet when most people don't even carry cash now in Australia versus, you know, intercepting an invoice or hacking a, a sort of a, a website and getting bills. Banking details, you know, you could steal $50 million versus trying to, again, push someone over, grab their wallet or handbag and, and steal $50. So it's just sort of, it's, it's no comparison now, the scale and complexity of the, the hacking and fraud and financial stuff and other sort of stuff that goes on these days and the risks. What are you curious about now? Um, yeah, and no, I think um, always very interested, like the entrepreneurial um, growth. Um, the podcast, again, is called The Future of Australia because I wanted a broader, like I didn't call it, you know, Australian fast growth businesses. I call it The Future of Australia because I do, I'm not 100% clear, but I do have maybe a vision to in the future expand it out. So again, I guess in some ways I started more specialising in the future. I, I may or may not sort of generalise it. But even then, I think by interviewing the fastest growing new businesses, I'm very curious about, you know, what industries are growing well, what geographies are growing well, what what types of businesses and business models are growing really well. Because in my mind, it, well, if there are a three-year-old company that's gone from zero to, to 50 million in three years, there's a fascinating hidden growth story that people haven't yet caught on to there. Obviously, they've captured a segment of the market or an industry or a trend or a business model um, and, and they've gone off like a rocket ship and, and that's, I'm very curious, I suppose, in some ways about the future. What's the future of the Australian workforce, the Australian economy, um, geopolitically, culturally? So I suppose in, in a lot of ways, I'm sort of, as the name suggests, I'm very interested and curious about the future of Australia. Are there any insights that, are there any other insights that you can give out to the to the public? Uh, where, uh, where are, where's the general direction of businesses going in Australia? Uh, I mean, it's a pretty broad question. Um, I'm happy, I'm happy for you to take the stage and take it anywhere. <laughs> Yeah, no, and I do look at trends um, across the companies. Like you, you realise obviously how much of the Australian economy, for better or worse, and you could debate both sides, is connected to the property industry. Um, so on the surface, people see property prices and buying houses and stuff like that. But I think I once did a, a bit of a, a quick analysis and so about 40 of the 100 fastest growing new businesses were property related, whether that's mortgage broking, buying property, um, buyer's agents, um, investing in property, um, architecture, construction, construction recruitment, fit out companies, um, engineering. So, so if you take the broad, I guess, umbrella of property, you understand how many businesses, even non-property businesses, all sort of um, benefit off that trend of sort of property um, in Australia. And that's, you know, again, if you understand that, then you understand why the government's always very sort of pro-property on both sides, because 
you know, so much business is depending on it's not just the real estate agent or the home builder, and like I said, that are off on the fast growth list, but it's the mortgage broker, it's the the custom kitchen renovator, it's the you know, someone else who's supplying, you know, stuff to the property industry. So, so you realize interesting trends like, oh wow, there's a lot more. Like everyone knows properties, everyone loves sort of property in Australia, or a lot of people do, but but you realize how many sub-industries sort of feed off that. And if property prices were to go down, you know, how many things um, would be sort of impacted, both at the big corporate level where you've got the big four banks being the six biggest companies in Australia and being 20 to 30 percent of the entire ASX. So they're backed by property, but then the super funds invest in the share market. So the super is backed by property. And then a lot of, like I said, small businesses are property related. A lot of personal wealth of Australians is in property, their own house or investment properties. Um, a lot of the media, profitable, the most profitable parts of the media are the real estate section, you know, realestate.com, which is owned by the media companies. And then, you know, other parts of uh, the society and economy own a lot of property. Um, so, so you realize like that's, I guess, an insight or a key piece that sort of about how important property is. Um, or, and it's, again, some people say, well, that's the problem that it's so property focused. But other people say, well, that's why I've done well. So like I said, you could debate both sides, but I guess that's another insight, just the importance of property as a driver of the Australian economy. Wow. All right. Well, we're coming up to about 50 minutes. I think I might put the pin in it there. Uh, it's been, it's been fantastic speaking with you, Derek, and I've just got a, uh, your details have flashed up on the screen there. So that's the future of Australia podcast. You guys can check that out. I've actually put a, a link in the description for this episode. So you can check that out. And um, any final messages for the, for the guys listening at home? Just a you know, massive thank you, Christian, for having me on the podcast. I love what you're doing. I love, like you said, that you follow your own curiosity. You, you got a, a interest instead of just kind of reading about in a book, you try and get people on your show. Um, you have a chat to them, you ask good questions. Like I said, I love the creative energy and fun that you bring and, and, and like I said, the questions. So keep doing what you're doing and um, yeah, just amazing work and thanks for having me. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Cheers.